Welcome back to Believe in Softball. I'm your host, Jenna Becerra. And however you got here today, whether it was an audio podcast platform like Apple, Spotify, etc., or watching on YouTube, thank you. Subscribe and rate the show wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Believe in Softball. That's B-L-E-A-V. And there's merch. Click the link in our bio on either of those pages or go to shop.believe.com to purchase three different shirts for you, covering our bases, safer out, and catch you soon. All right, let's go through today's batting order. First, we'll be covering our bases. I'll share some call outs from the softball world. Then we'll head into today's interview with Stacey Mae Johnson. From playing in college to the pros internationally to coaching now, she has just had a multi-dimensional impact that I'm excited for you to hear about. And then we'll end things with the foul tip of the week where we share tips to help us get better. All right, let's go. Covering our bases. Bet online is your number one source for all your summer sports this season from MLB, golf, NBA, and NHL playoff stats. All the latest stats, news, and scores available to follow your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet online where the game starts. And opportunity starts at Rippet Sports right here as well. Don't wait. Get after it. My ringer turfs continue to be a favorite in my wardrobe. I might actually bust out my Rippet backpack this weekend, too, as I travel from field to field. We'll see. But what's cool is that their mission is to elevate female athletic performance. They understand that women and girls deserve gear specifically tailored to our unique needs. Gear that fits right, performs well, and meets our demands. So... Rip it is offering an exclusive 15% discount. Just use the code Jenna15 when you shop at ripit.com. That's J E N N A 1 5. This is your chance to experience the same quality gear that helps so many women and girls excel. And as usual, college softball seems to excel, but in craziness a little bit. So it was just insane watching the top 10 teams in the nation, eight of them lost at least one game this past week. Half of those also lost an entire series, like Oklahoma State losing to Iowa State, for example, and that was the highest ranked series win that Iowa State has had in program history. And then there were a few from the SEC as well. Florida, LSU, Georgia all dropped their series. So everyone but Texas, who sits at number one, and Washington, who had a bye week in the Pac-12, but they did go 2-0 with a road win against Boise State, and then they also hosted Seattle as well. But that was just insane to see. And this is why rankings are really hard. Um, But I do want to give some love to Virginia Tech. I was watching game three against Boston College and just an absolutely insane just series of events. They were down four to one in the bottom of the fifth. They scored 12 runs in the inning. uh, Capped off with a walk-off grand slam by Corey McMillan to run rule them. So there, there was a moment earlier in the, in the inning as well where there was a check swing and it should have been called strike three. She did go. She went. It was not called on the hitter. Uh, it's not a reviewable play either, so they had to just keep it moving. And obviously Boston College was frustrated, right? Like they, they thought they had it. But she ended up getting on base and then Virginia Tech just kept passing the bat. There were several walks and five singles, four of which also included an RBI before that grand slam even happened. So with this win, you know, it was their first ACC series sweep with three run rolls and the 300th career win for head coach Pete DeMoor. So I think it's summarized best in our friend of the show, previous guest, Kenzie Fowler. She was an analyst and she said it at the end. She was like, what did we just watch? (laughs) It was crazy. But I think that's the kind of energy that you have to have, right, to, to compete to the very last out and just keep passing the bat. So just wanted to give them a shout out. Uh, and then Howard, another friend of the show, head coach Tori Tyson, they actually set a new program record. Um, they broke their own win streak record. Now it's 12. They've won 12 in a row uh, as their longest streak during their time. And I think it's interesting, and I like that they're celebrating it, because we talk about how you actually kind of compete against yourself more than the opponent in some ways. And I think this is an example of it, right? Like you can't really control what they're doing. You can just control what you're doing. So 
kind of staying within yourself and within your team. And also reminder that she won her 100th game as the Bison's head coach earlier this season. So I would just say one thing about that program, they're just going to keep coming. So second, some pro softball updates, a, a little bit of a roller coaster because there's lots happening here. First, the, the best news, Jocelyn Allo will make her Athletes Unlimited debut. The home run queen will play in AUX at Wichita State June 10th through the 25th. This is before the season with the OKC Spark. She's doing both. She's the first athlete to play in both. This is a huge win for professional softball, she said. And she said, and this is so much bigger than myself, but represents the women I am playing alongside as well in both leagues. Not a surprise that with this kind of collaboration, TV seems to fall into place when these things happen, right? So actually all the AUX games are going to be on ESPN's linear channels, aka they're going to be on TV, not just streaming. They're going to be on ESPN2 and ESPNU. And by the way, don't forget the AU is also playing a couple games against the Spark July 12th and 13th. So I was happy about some of the collaboration going on. This, this really is huge. More of this, please. Because think about it, the exposure is going to help the Spark too. It's the biggest recent name in softball that we have is Jocelyn Allo. So to channel all of that energy together is a big deal. And we haven't always had that in pro softball. You know, so kudos to OKC Spark owner Tina Floyd and AU leader Sherry Kempf for making moves here. On the not as exciting side, USSA Pride did announce that they will not operate in 2024. So despite great effort and substantial conversation, they said, this was really a bummer. And some veterans like Monica Abbott, Kat Osterman, they both said it like it's sad because this is an organization that has been a staple in pro softball. It's been one that has a lot of history. Like it's just not not the best news. But with the WPF overall, they, they've had some announcements themselves and they're still trying to iron things out for the season. So the Texas Smoke and their owner, Brandon Phillips, uh, his team at Be For Real Enterprises is working with USSA, Smash It Sports, trying to figure out what they're going to do. And remember, this is after the Spark had already left to go independent and they joined the Association of Fast Pitch Professionals. They have announced for WPF that the league is going international. So they're adding two Mexican teams to the mix. So they're trying to figure something out. One thing that I thought was really cool that's somewhat related, but just I have to shout out, is that some Texas Smoke players went to WrestleMania. Why does this matter, right? So Bailey Klingler, Morgan Howe, Janae Jefferson, Maddie Grimm, all played for the Smoke. They all wore shirts supporting Jade Cargill, who's a co-owner of the Smoke, and she's signed with WWE, and she performed. And it was really cool to see them take photos with her, with other superstars like Naomi, Bianca Belair. If you know WWE, you know what I'm talking about. And then if you're anyone on the face of the earth, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, unless you're literally living under a Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Um, for the OGs who know too, this is interesting to me because I tried out to be a WWE wrestler back in the day, literally went to the performance center in Orlando and everything. So it's a few of my favorite things, right? And I low key would love for the rock to invest in pro softball, just saying, especially because we remember, we can't forget that there aren't any softball Olympic games in 2024 in Paris. We talk about growing the game globally to get back in consistently because we are back in 2028, but we don't want to do this back and forth. We want to stay in it. I think there's still plenty of room for growth here in the U S beyond just youth and at the college level. So there's a little bit of this, like let's eat at our own restaurant as well. And maintaining a solid professional foundation here can only help us. I think when it comes to the rest of the world. So we have a runway leading to LA 2028. Let's use it. And on that runway, some exciting things happening. The USA national team rosters have been announced. So the main roster led by Heather Tarr will compete in the World Cup. And the elite team roster led by Kelly Kretschmann will compete in the Japan All-Star Series. This is exciting because there's so much crossover, even just on a personal level for me. We have five believers with Megan Framo, Rachel Garcia, Hannah Flippin, Jesse Warren from this season. Then, of course, Heather Tarr. So add that one in all going to compete in the World Cup. And then Nigeri Kennedy will be on that Japan All-Star Series. So that's amazing. There's six total 
from this show that are friends of this thing that we've built together. And then from the D1 softball perspective in my role there, let's call them the D1 percenters. My podcast host, Amanda Lorenz, is on the team. It's so awesome. And then on our digital team, we have covered Haley McClenney this year, Tiari Jennings I got to interview, Maya Brady, Rachel Garcia, uh, Nigel Kennedy, Paige Halstead, and Amanda got to help me with all of this. So we all kind of split these things up. And then Taryn Kern as well. She'll be competing, and I think it's just really cool to see kind of their journeys from earlier in the season when we first got in touch with them to to now and what they're going to be doing in the summer. And then I've also been super fortunate to have covered at least 10 of these players in broadcasts that just throughout my career. So a lot of the, the folks I've already mentioned, but add in Deja Molipola, Sis Bates, Bailey Klingler, Megan Grant, Lexi Kilfoyle, like... It is going to be so fun, again, just seeing the growth of their careers. And I did attend a press conference they held with the two head coaches and some of the players. And what stood out to me was just the dedication that's there. You know, Ali Carta, she talked about how it was crazy. She's gone from being like one of the younger ones on the team to now she's a veteran. And just talking about being dedicated to everything, even the little things like breath work, you know, the gratitude that goes along with this. Hannah Flippin talked about that a lot, like what it means to wear that USA uniform. And then the competitive drive too. I mean, Kelly Kretschmann's out there talking about, hey, Heather, if we play you all head to head, like we're going to beat you, you know, and to hear that coming from an Olympian, right, is just so, so cool. And so I think I'm excited to see that. So even though we don't have the Olympics, we do have some cool things on deck this summer for USA softball. And then to bring it home, um, some of the stuff I got going on. So new D1 softball episode came out. Me and Amanda Lorenz back at it. We interviewed Texas A&M head coach Trisha Ford after they took the series at Alabama. She coached me at Stanford. She's been on this show back in season one. And she's engaged with Amanda, too, with like USA stuff in the past. And so it was just a great one for all of us to catch up. The win and whiff of the week segment has some great college softball moments in it, too. In addition to what I've already mentioned in covering our bases here, especially with Oregon and Arizona. So check that out to know what I'm talking about. And then what's coming up? I'm calling more games on TV with Pac-12 Networks. Next up, the UCLA series at Stanford Friday and Saturday. And then I'll be at Cal. Washington's in town on Sunday. So tune into those because they're, they're both a couple of cool matchups that we got going, some ranked matchups out here on the West. More in the works, too, as we get closer to postseason. So keep an eye on this space. But someone who also has some good things in the works is today's guest. Let's head into the interview. She is the Fresno State head coach, two-time national pro fast pitch champion and MVP, multi-time international medalist with Team USA, and three-time All Big Ten player at Iowa, Stacy Mae Johnson. Coach, thanks for joining. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you, especially because you know from your playing days to your coaching days now, like you've had such an impact on the sport. So I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, no, this is this is fun. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be on the podcast today. And uh, I love talking softball. So this is great. Yeah, who that's that's our number one, right? Talking softball. I do have to ask you, though, because you're an Iowa alum, got to ask you about some women's basketball, I think, too. Just happened, right? Watching Caitlin Clark and just all of the attention and the growth that her and the team has have created really this season, but even building up to it, like as an alum, what's it like watching that unfold? I mean, it was awesome. I mean, she's amazing. And obviously she's an Iowa girl. Um, You know, coach Bluter was coaching there um, when I was a student athlete. So, uh, and, and, you know, you look back on it, coach Bluter took him to the sweet 16 uh, before Caitlin Clark. I, I think there was a, a player that was, I don't think she won it, but I think she was in the running for the national player of the year named Megan Gustafson. And when Meg Gustafson came through the program, I thought, man, there's, I don't know that they'll ever have a player that good again. And then within a year or two, Caitlin Clark rolls in and I said, I, I, I stand corrected here. So, um, no, it's, it was really cool. It was really, it was really cool to see, um, the program grow. And, and like I said, like kind of watching the journey with coach Bluter all these years, I mean, she, she probably doesn't know me, but I, I know her and I followed the program and I was friends with the basketball players and went to the games, um, you know, back in college. So it's just been a lot of fun for me to watch it. 
That's the kind of stuff I like to learn more about too, like the buildup, right? Because it's not like this happened yeah. overnight. That's not how it works in sports. So I love hearing that. That actually makes me think of the Fresno State softball program to a certain degree too. Just I don't know if everybody understands the history of the program fully too in that way. 1998 national champions, you know, Laura Berg went there, the most decorated USA softball player in Olympic history. Um, and only it's just one of two programs outside the power five to win the national championship in the NCAA era. Does that sink in when you're there? Um, you know, I day to day, I don't know that I, I necessarily think about it, but I am very aware of the history of the tradition, um, of the expectations here in Fresno. I, you know, we're no fool to that. And Obviously, you don't you don't step into a role like this in a place like this without understanding the history. So yeah, it's definitely there and we're very proud of it, you know. And when you look at what we do and what we have, the success that we have today, make no mistake, is is directly related to that success. I mean, I've said this many times before. I I, I feel like in a program like this, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, we we have what we have because of the greatness that came before us. So uh, you know, we're aware. Um, I'm extremely grateful. I'm extremely grateful to, to be a, a part of a program like this. Um, this is special, you know, like you said, one of two programs outside the power five to win a national championship. Um, maybe one of the best, if not the best facility on the West coast. Um, this is a cool place. You know, we, we, we pack the stadium out. There's, there's fans out there, a ton of them every single game. Um, and, and so it is a special place. Got to ask you about Margie Wright Diamond. You brought it up too. Uh, well, two parts to it, right? The actual, the atmosphere. I would love to hear more about that. And then also who it's named after, right? We'll get to that in a second. Yeah, the atmosphere is incredible. Um, you know, that we, where this is the best attended uh, softball program in the state of California. A lot of people think it's UCLA. It's not. It's Fresno. Um, you know, there's, there's an environment here. Um, there's a distinct home field advantage. You ask anybody that comes to play here. Uh, it's different. It's different playing here. You know, we, we played Utah State this past weekend and uh, they didn't play well. You know, we did. They didn't play well. I, you know, the, to me, they got outside their game and I can't help but look around and think maybe it's not those those thousand plus fans that are that are kind of yelling at them, you know, um, and our, our community is really passionate about softball. So uh, I know our student athletes feel that support. Um, I know that it makes it really fun to be a part of. Um, you know, there's a lot of places you go and it's like, OK, the moms and the dads are up there, but you know, it's, it's, it feels like it's kind of crickets, you know, you score some runs and there's a few claps, but you know, in this place, like, you know, there's a roar, like there's a roar of the stadium. It's, it's a very different experience. Mm, I love that though. That's so fun to play in that kind of atmosphere. You know, even if you're playing against Fresno State, it might be tough, like you said, with Utah State, but at the same time, it's like, that's kind of why we play, right? Is to be able to play in environments like that. No doubt. And when you look at um, the level that the game has gotten to the level of competitiveness uh, today. Uh, you know, the game has progressed. I mean, even, you know, I'm not too old, but I guess I'm a few years removed now. And the game has progressed. It just has. I mean, by and large, it is better today than it was when I played. And I think that these student athletes are so deserving of the opportunity for for people to watch them, to, to get some of that recognition. Um, to have people care a little bit because the quality of the game is really, really good right now. Yes. Well, it's thanks to a lot of people like you who have decided to pay it forward as well with all your experience as a player. Now you're on the coaching side. Um, and I'll, I'll definitely be asking you more about your playing days. Got to. But before that, too, Margie Wright, like we said, um, I remember actually just how tough she was. I think I did get to play against her towards the end of my collegiate career. And I remember she had come out to a game my travel ball team was playing and she told our head coach, you know, there are a bunch of cream puffs out there. Like they got to, they got to toughen up a little bit. And um, that has stuck with me just how intense she was, but she was obviously a big part of getting it to where you all are now today. Yeah. I mean, she's just a through and through winner. Um, she's tough as nails, no doubt about it. Um, but always led her team well and, and, and was just, just competitive, this type of person that's not going to be denied. And, uh, and that, that clearly showed itself on the field. She, uh, she was pioneer on top of that. It wasn't just a, you know, she wasn't just a great softball coach. She's a, she's a pioneer for women's athletics. She's a pioneer for softball. 
um, certainly changed the trajectory of the softball program, you know, in this community and at this school, but uh, did it on a much broader scale. You know, it was people like Coach Wright um, that really propelled softball into what it is today. Yes. So when you come in then, right, to this environment, this type of program, and you're thinking about putting your staff together and you have your staff, how does that process go as you're trying to build up what your version of that looks like? Yeah, well, I mean, at the end of the day, we all have to be ourselves. You know, we can't be counterfeit. Um, I'm not Coach Wright. I have to be. I have to be Coach Stacy May Johnson. That's who I am, right? And so I'm. I'm true to myself. Um, you know, and and the landscape does change, right? I mean, we're, we're remiss to if we don't say that. Oh, this is exactly the same. It's right. not exactly the same. It's different today. Um, and so, you know, we we have to play by the rules that that we're given, right? We have to play in the era. Uh, that, that we have, we have film at, at an incredible, incredible level. You know, we have information that I, when I was playing, I didn't have that information, right? Today I have that information. It does impact the way we coach. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I stay true to myself. Um, I think I, I coach, I coach on my terms, um, you know, and, and I'm not apologetic for that. I am who I am. Um, and I believe that uh, I, I have a little bit of coach right in me and that um, I'm pretty persistent. I won't be denied. Um, I'm certainly a fighter. I'm not a quitter. Um, and, and so I, I'd like to think that uh, our team displays that as well uh, and that uh, you're going to see a team that, that plays really hard. You're going to see a team that uh, has a growth mindset that's always improving, always getting better. Um, and, and certainly in a place like this, we have everything we need to be successful. Yes. I notice some of that toughness in the Mountain West Conference as a whole, too. I feel like we don't talk about it enough at a national level, actually. So when you're looking at that landscape, what sticks out to you the most? Yeah, well, right now it feels like it's a conference that's going to beat itself up in the best of ways, right? It doesn't feel like um, I mean, the, everybody from the top to bottom is really pretty good, um, you know, and anybody can beat anybody on any given day. Um, I think that this particular conference is probably the steepest home field advantage conference in the country. I've, mm. I've been a part of a few different conferences. Home field advantage here in this conference is a bigger edge uh, in the Mountain West than it is in any other conference that I've been a part of. Um, it, the, the game drastically changes from lo one location to another. So it's, it's interesting in that way. And it, you know, obviously keeps us on our, our toes of like, um, Hey, are we building a roster that can win at home? Yes. That always has to be the case, but are we building a roster that can win in the Mountain West? Um, and that might look really, really different. So um, it's a really challenging and competitive uh, conference to be a part of, um, but I think it's really super fun. Um, I mean, we love that. We love that competition. What do you think the biggest factors are to that home field advantage? Obviously, not just for you guys, but across the board. Is it the atmosphere, the fans, the facilities? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, well, I do think in Fresno, it is the atmosphere, it is yes. the fans, it is the stadium, it is the fact that we've won the psychological war before the other team even starts the game. They mm -hmm. walk in the stadium and they say, wow, we don't have that at home. Yeah, Everybody does it, right? So like we've won a psychological adv advantage before the game has started. Make no mistake about that. Once you get past that that uh, Fresno effect, I mean, it's elevation, right? It's it's a it's a, a stadium where the ball just flies out. Um you know, you hit the ball off the end of your bat, miss hit it, and it goes over the fence, blows in the wind and goes for a home run. Uh, or if you go down to San Diego, you can tag it and you, the ball gets caught in the right center gap at the fence. You know, yeah. um, there's there's portions of, of San Jose's park that are 235 with probably 14 foot wall. I mean, so you're just you're dealing with such such drastic changes in, you know, the way you generate offense that there's got to be some adjustment within that. But you have to you have to build a roster that's capable of adjusting within that. How do you do that balance as a group, meaning sticking to your strengths, your game, right? Being yourselves, but then also making adjustments. Cause I feel like that's always the balance of softball players that, that we're trying to get to. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I, I think it is a balance. I think you have to stay true to who you are, right. And the way that your, your team wins, the way that your team uh, scores runs or doesn't give up runs. Um, and so you, you start there, right. And then, um, you take certain players that maybe have certain skill sets and you give them a slightly different objective, um, you know? And so, so if we, if we go to elevation and we have a player who we feel is, um, is dangerous enough, then maybe, maybe, you know, we, we 
that week at practice, we work on hitting the bottom third of the ball, which is not something we typically do at home, but maybe for a certain week, we'll, we'll go for the bottom third of the ball. Um, you know, and then we have other players that we don't feel that that's their strength. And so then, you know, ladies, we're going to square the ball up. I want you hitting line drives. And so, you know, there's small adjustments that happen on that front that can be very, very useful and can, can swing a game in either direction. But I mean, that's your core. You have to be who you are. Right. And you said it too, even as a coach, same thing as a player, right? That goes for everybody in the staff. Yeah. But Absolutely. the Valley, we've talked about like the atmosphere that you have at home when you're playing, but just that area. I mean, you're coming from, you're a Nevada native, right? And then you're coming over into this experience in the Fresno area. What sticks out there for you? Well, the Valley is special, you know, and, and when people think, if they think of California, they probably think of Southern California and, um, and just whatever, whatever comes to mind, big city, uh, the Bay Area, you know, the hustle and bustle, San Francisco, right? I think that's what most people think about when they think of California. The Valley's different. It's, it's, a, it's a much more um, tight-knit community, homegrown. It's not as, as densely populated. Um, everybody here's a bulldog, I can tell you that. If, if you're within a couple of hours, if you were born in the Valley, you are, you are born bred bulldog, you know? Um, so there's real support for this school. Um, there's real support for our student athletes. So, um, you know, and I, I think, you know, there's tremendous talent at the grassroots level of youth softball and, and in a lot of sports, a lot of Valley athletes go off in a lot of different sports and have very, very successful collegiate careers and beyond. Um, and so there's tremendous talent here that grows up as a bulldog. And that's yeah. awesome. You know, that's an amazing advantage. I, I can go off and watch um, a local softball game here in this area. And at any given time, I mean, there, there could be five to 10 division one softball players on that field in a high school game. Yeah. Um, that's pretty cool. That's really cool. I like watching high school softball. It's a lot of fun. So, so the Valley is, is a neat opportunity, um, not only to, to play in front of, to represent, um, here at Fresno State, but then also to like start to recruit and start to, to bring many of these young women, um, up along the way, like continuing that hope that they can be bulldogs one day. That pride is, is so strong. You're so right. I remember playing with several girls from the Fresno area on my travel team growing up, um, which I'm from Ventura County in, in Southern California. A lot of folks are from like Orange County, kind of all over the place, but they would come down to play with us. And there was very much this, like they want to play at Fresno State. There was a lot of pride there for it. Some of them did go on to do that. Some of them went elsewhere, whatever ended up working out for them, but you could feel that from them. Uh, and the toughness that they brought. And so I believe that when you're watching high school games, I'm like, yep, I had teammates who I'm sure used to be a part of that at one point. Yeah, it, it is cool. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool to to see our, our Valley natives compete here. And, um, you know, they, they grew up seeing this as a destination. It is a destination. Yeah. You know, if anybody thinks this isn't a destination, they're wrong, you know. Yeah. Um, and certainly on our side, on the recruiting side, is that's exactly what we want. We want recruits that will see this as a destination as the destination that it is you know we don't have a crappy stadium we have an awesome stadium you know we don't have a crappy crowd we have an awesome crowd you know, we have a history of championships and we're going to continue that history of championships off into the future you know and if people you know if, if there's somebody that can't see that well that's not our people that's yeah. not our recruit. that that's fine they, they can go somewhere else but like we want the people that see this and they're invested in this, right? Because man, they play a little bit harder and that's what we're looking for. We're always looking for that edge. It's always a really small edge. It's never, it's never a big, you know, I don't see a lot of championship games being won by, by 11 runs. I see right. championship games being won by one run, right? You tell me what's the difference. If there's some sort of edge, whatever it may be, you know, and, and for, for Fresno state, it could be our Valley tradition, our Valley student athletes, our Valley young women that fight just a little bit harder because it's Fresno state. Mm, so true. You're firing me up. Like I'm like ready to suit up right now because of all of this. This is awesome. Uh, it's a great point though, with the different parts of California too. I tell people that all the time. I'm like, you don't understand how many different areas and different types of landscape. There's a little bit of everything. And so the Valley is a good example of like, yeah, it, it is a lot more than San Francisco and LA. I love that you brought that up because it's very true as a California native. I appreciate that observation too. Yeah, well, it's helpful. I think it's helpful for a lot of our, if we go out of state, which we have a few out of state recruits, but yeah. um, it's helpful for them to understand like, hey, this is whatever, whatever you're expecting, it's not going to be exactly what you expect, whatever you were thinking. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, no, we get it. Yeah. 
Well, and you know what that's like having gone to Iowa, right? Like you went out of state to a new region during your playing days, um, worked out for you clearly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So you can relate. Yeah. It's very cool. It's big tens, uh, is, uh, I, I do love the, the culture and the communities in the big 10 and, um, there's a lot of really cool college towns in there. So yeah, that was absolutely, uh, you know, when you come out of high school, somebody's got to paint that picture for you of, of you know, what is this place? What, you know, what does this look like? And then obviously you go on the trip and you see it and you're like, okay, I get this. I can get on board with this. And, and that's really the, that's the experience that we definitely try to uh, create with our recruits. Luckily the local ones, they already know, yeah. you know, we don't have to paint the picture. The picture picture has been painted for them since they were three years old. Yeah. So if you had to paint the picture in just three words to describe Fresno State softball, what would they be? Yeah. Um, blue collar, you know, yep. Hardworking. Okay. And I know this isn't one word, but, um, and I love this. We have enough to win, Mm. but we don't have enough to be bougie, you know, like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like it's, and that's uh, like, I, if I have somebody say, Hey, you know, I'm going to go to this school with palm trees by the beach. We have palm trees, but yeah. I'm going to go to this school with palm trees by the beach. I'm like, perfect. You didn't belong here. Mm. Right. Like you came to Fresno because of what it is. Right. If you were looking for the beach or for a palm tree, oh, you got a beach, you drive two hours to Pismo. It's not like you can't get to the beach. Yeah. Like it's still a cool place to live. But like if you need the beach, then you're not our people. You know, you come to Fresno because you want to grind. Yeah. You come to Fresno for the experience, for the student athlete experience for the community, right? Like for the community feel. Um, I would tell you this, like I, being a softball coach, you move around the country, you do a lot of moving, right? Yeah. Like um, more moving that is probably ideal, at least on a personal level, because you kind of have to restart like relationships and, and, and community is everything. Yes. Okay. The people you're surrounded with is everything. Okay. As a coach, if I go to a new place and I don't have a community, then, then the experience is empty. Mm. You know, that's, and that's just like on a human level, right? Like yep. obviously like it's a beautiful part of being part of a team is that you have an instant community in, in that sense. But, yeah. you know, Fresno, I think, um, brings that community aspect uh, better than probably anything else in California. This is a different place when it comes to that component. So um, I love that. I love that about this place. I love that when our student athletes go to the grocery store, yeah, people know who they are. They do, you know, you know, hey, great game. Great win on on Friday, Taylor. Great job. Yeah. You pitched great. You know, they don't know who they are, but, you know, our community knows who our student athletes are. Yeah, that is really special. That's just yeah. true support, too, at the end of the day, like you're saying. But I love the blue collar piece. I mean, as somebody who is a was a first generation college graduate and first generation student athlete and all that stuff, like that is more of the mentality that you grow up with. So when you see that translate to folks on the field, which I do and the toughness that you're talking about that Fresno state has, like I personally love to see that play out. Um, so that's why I've enjoyed watching your program too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Do you have to ask you about your playing days as well, as I mentioned, because there's so much to unpack there. I mean, obviously the college experience that we've touched on a little bit, but you played professional softball for the bandits for a while. And I think that's a dream that a lot of us have had. And it's been sort of in and out as to what the opportunities are, but you, you got to do that and play at that level. What was that experience like for you? Yeah. Um, I felt like I, I got to, to play in a really, really cool time. Um, you know, I love, I love AU sports. Um, yeah. I think it's awesome. Um, I did very much enjoy, uh, the traditional team component of what I got to experience. I, I never did the AU thing and maybe I would have loved it more. I don't know. Cause yeah. I, I know that like in many ways, that's almost even a tighter community. Mm. Um, but I did love, I love the bandits. I love being a part of, of that program. And I got to be a part of that program for a long time. I didn't, you know, I didn't, go here or go there. And it's certainly the lines on that are thin, you know, yeah. like I, I could have easily, uh, have never cracked the lineup in my first year and maybe been traded. And then, you know, who knows, but I, it didn't, it didn't play out that way. I got to be with the bandits my entire career. Um, and it, it can, it's, a, I'm a bandit at heart, you know? Um, 
So I thought that I got to be a part of it in, um, to me, what was the most special time. Um, you know, I, I don't know, like, did it get to the point where uh, everybody was making a living um, year round? No, maybe not. But, um, you know, it, to me, I, I still just cherish the experience. I thought that it was, um, you know, it's a little bit of a, your glory days, I guess. And I, I look back really, really fondly on the organization, on my time. Um, and just the opportunity that I had, you know, because those opportunities are, they're fewer and far between today than what they were back then. You know, even, even in the time when there was only four or five teams, there's still more opportunity then than there is today. So, um, I'm just really grateful for all of that. Yeah. The fact that your glory days were in a professional setting, right? When so many people it's, it ends up being college just because of the way it is, that is really special. And also you're right. The bandits, we're talking about history with Fresno state and, and even Iowa from that experience you had. But the Bandits are a very historical pro team for us too. I mean, everybody always gives credit, and I appreciate this, to Kansas City and the women's soccer stadium that they're building. Everyone keeps saying it's the first one ever built for pro sports. But in reality, if you go back, it's actually a Chicago Bandits facility in Chicago that was built for pro softball at that time. So it sounds like you know, community toughness and good facilities is something that that is a common thread with you. It's a good starting place. It's a really good starting place. Yeah. Yeah. But to see um, it still being used, I mean, obviously the bandits with the NPF, it's a different story now, but the fact that Athletes Unlimited, to your point, they still play uh, there. Um, not, I think they're going to go to Wichita State, so not every single time, but the fact that they've used that facility is pretty cool. I've, I've enjoyed watching it. Yeah, no, it's awesome. It's an unbelievable facility. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I, it, it's a great place for, for, for the women to play. And obviously the city of Roma, Rosemont was very forward thinking, always has been um, in putting that facility in there. They have a lot of action come through that stadium. Yeah, they certainly do. I've also noticed when talking to players from your era too, like you're talking about the time in which you got to play professionally there's a level of, of toughness that it takes to be a professional softball player from what I gather. Um, and I, I've seen that as a common theme sort of, as I've talked to you and some others who have experienced that too. Do you feel like that sets you up in a certain way to be a coach now, for example? Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we learned a ton. We learned a ton just continuing to play, I, I learned as much from my teammates as I did from my coaches. Um, there were some really, really amazing, physically talented athletes, and there were some really, really great minds. And we were just kind of all learning and growing together. We talked the game, you know, we, we'd go back and we lived in community too. There's another, that's another piece, right? Like you talk about those pro teams, um, you, you all live in the same apartment complex, right? <laughs> so you're doing life together, right? Like you're doing you're doing, you know, basically 24 hours a day for that, those summer months, you're doing life together. Um, and so that just, it, it was just so, um, it was just so organic, you know, like it was never scripted, like, Hey, let's go sit down and talk softball. No, it just happened. Um, and we learned a lot. We learned so much and, and got better. And, um, we faced a lot of the same pitchers over and over. We try to figure out how to hit them. Right. And pitchers same a lot of the same hitters over and over, try to figure out how to get them out. Um, no, it was, it was just a tremendous um, opportunity for growth and, and to do it with, you know, some of, some of my best friends, um, you know, just, just people that I just really enjoyed being around. Yeah. That's the other part I've heard how hard it is as a pitcher, as a hitter, all the things you just said, because it's a grind. And these are the, the best of the best that filtered from even college to play at that level. Right. So that's also why it's so cool to watch when we do get that opportunity. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think when, you mentioned toughness. Um, you know, like it wasn't just one player that experienced this, but, um, the jump into professional softball. Okay. So you're 22, 23, you just came off winning a world series or whatever, whatever your story is, right. You just came off an amazing college career, whatever your story is. Um, nine out of 10 struggle hard that first year. Yeah. There's just a jump in pitching. Um, there's a jump in, softball IQ. Um, there's a tremendous level of failure. So you, you have somebody that, that maybe hit 400 plus at the collegiate level, 
some of them even 500 plus, right, at the collegiate level. And then they roll into town and they're hitting 215, okay? And it's like, well, I thought I was supposed to be this. I thought it, it's the same transition from high school to college. Just sometimes the the super, super talented ones, like they, they kind of push through that transition really quickly. Yeah. But at the pro level, I'm going to tell you right now, nine out of 10, that first year is hard. Really, really, really hard. And so when you talk about the players that make it five plus years, they had to grind through that. Yeah. Okay. And and a lot of them, it was easy to say, hey, I'm not having success at the level that I want to have success. You know what? I'm going to go get that job that I was looking for. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go do something else with my life, right? Like whatever it is, right? But there's got to be some some toughness for the people that stuck it out over time. A, they got to love the game. Yeah. Because it wasn't always easy, right? And then B, you know, they've got to trust their process and work through that failure that they initially initially experience, right? To get to that level of success that it takes time to get to, right? I mean, we don't really think about this in softball, but to me, the best baseball players are in their thirties, probably their early thirties, right? Before they start to hit too much of like a physical decline, right? Yep. Maybe, maybe a small amount of physical decline from your late twenties into your thirties. Right. But like, you know, they, they've, they've maybe plateaued a little bit physically, but mentally they get better right? They've done it before and they just really start to roll in their thirties, right? Think about that. Think about that. Like, but for some reason we think the best softball players in the world are 22 years old. They're not, Yeah, Yeah. they're not, you know, it's the ones that were, they, they had that level of talent, but then they, they push through those years where they transition to the professional ranks and it's hard. Right. Very true. So in terms of not that we can solve this in, in just a few minutes here, but what do you think is going to be key for us to be able to establish uh, the stability that we're looking for for professional softball in the U.S.? Obviously, there are opportunities in Japan and elsewhere, but to do it here. Oh, man, I, I almost feel like that question is uh, outside of my area. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. You know, but uh, TV, mm. uh, TV is going to be crucial. I, I know that um, softball has a foothold right? Like we're seeing, it's a great sport. It's a fantastic spectator sport. Obviously we see what's happening with the world series and the viewership and all that stuff. Um, how does that translate to the professional ranks? I'm not sure. I know that it's there. Um, I, do I know personally how to get it there? Uh, no, I don't, but I think TV is a big part of it. Yeah. The visibility piece. I mean, college softball, we've seen it, right. That makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. And even the Olympics too, like, unfortunately we're not in Paris, right. But like you had experience playing with USA across your chest and and you got to win with USA across your chest too. How does that compare to, you know, the pro experience, the college experience, this is representing your country. Well, it was, it was very special, you know, it was very different. Um, there's just something different about representing your country. Um, you know, I, I, I can tell you, I, I felt a lot of pride wearing that Iowa jersey. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Hawkeye. I'll always be a Hawkeye. Um, and luckily enough, I got to spend all those years with bandits. I, I'll always be a bandit. You know, I'll always be a bandit. Um, but it's, it's as much as I experienced it, that USA jersey, is, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more special. It's yeah. a little more special to represent your country. Uh, it's so rare to have that opportunity. It's so... It's just so unique. Um, and I, I, I fully recognize that like if the chips had fallen a different way here or there, it would have never happened. Right. Mm-hmm. Like there's a couple, a couple balls got to roll your way for that to happen. And they did, they rolled my way. Um, you know, especially for me, I, the, the, my first year with USA I was 27, my first tryout, I was 27. That's not a common story. That's you not, know, yeah. I, you know, most, most of the, like when they, when they, started it was okay I maybe tried out for the junior national team or maybe like I, I got a tryout late in my collegiate career I was 22 or you know whatever it is my first tryout was 27 I was 27 um I think my story is a little bit more unique um I think it make makes me maybe a bit more grateful um mm. I, I never I just I don't know I don't want to use but I am going to use the word I, I wasn't entitled mm-hmm. you know I was in no way shape or form entitled um I feel like I worked for everything I ever had. Uh, I feel like I earned everything I ever had. 
I took a very unconventional route to get there. And I was really, really proud of the opportunity to, to represent my country. You said it. The actually a little bit older is when people are peaking as athletes, as softball athletes, and then like look at the the timing in which it worked out for you. Like I just yeah. love that that happened because sometimes I wonder. It's like, well, what if I did keep playing, right? Because I stopped out for college, and I don't not just for myself, but even some of my teammates and others. You wonder about it. So I love for the people who do stick it out. To your point, who who got to see it through a little bit longer. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, in this sport, it's and obviously on the coaching side now, it's like um, one of the things we kind of try to quantify a little bit is is uh, is skill acquisition development, the ability to get better upside. Right. Um, and that's certainly not equal across the board. Right. Like where an athlete is today versus where they're going to be in two or three years is, is a big question that we, mm. we deal with on the recruiting side. Yep. Um, and I don't know that anybody has a, a crystal ball. Um if they did, then the NFL would get it right every single time because they have all the information, they have all the interviews and the analytics and all this and that. But they still, they still bust, right? Tom Brady was was drafted in the fifth round. Yeah, was, you know he was under projected, right? So it's not it's not an exact science, but um, I think that that's probably a little bit of my story is that um, I I and I don't I I think I have a clear understanding of why now why I was able to get better why I was not stagnant I just got better and better and better and better and I kept playing and I kept playing and got better and it happened for years and years and years I never stayed stagnant even even towards the end of my career I continued to get better um, and I look back on that and make no mistake about it without beyond a shadow of a doubt it was not physical it was 100% mental and heart. I hit my physical peak pretty early. Anybody that saw me play knew I wasn't very fast and I wasn't very strong compared to the type of athletes we see today, hmm. right? Like I just wasn't, but you know what? I kept figuring out how to hit the ball better and better. Yeah. You know, I just got smarter. I got wiser and, and the results took care of themselves. And it was just, I just wanted it more than everybody else. Like I just did. I just cared more than everybody else. I still do. Yeah. Um, and so that was a little bit of my, my story and, and my, my process of, Hey, I did have some upside that was really hard to see because you had to look and see the intangibles yeah. um, and the desire to, to do it um, and the just this unwillingness to back down ever. Right. So that's that's a little bit of who I am. That's a little bit of my story. I, I'm really grateful that I had the opportunities to um, to develop those skills along the way. Yeah. Well, and as your story continues as a coach, all of a sudden you're, you are wearing a lot of red, white and blue again right? Uh, nowadays, and you are working with the 18 to 22 year old sort of age range. So in terms of trying to get some of those learnings across, because that's the biggest thing, right? We always talk about what do we learn about ourselves? In addition to the community, it's like, what are those life lessons too? So how do you try to instill those types of things in your players? Yeah, we, we try to create an atmosphere of uh, consistency and mental approach. Um, we've, we've got growth mindset. Um, we're not too high. We're not too low. Um, you know, I, I think, I think the biggest challenge uh, for, for student athletes, I asked, I asked my team a year ago. Um, I didn't know what the response was going to be, but I said, you know, if I'm going to be honest with you guys, like I, I fight my demons, right? Like when it comes to this sport, I fight my demons. Like, um, you know, as an athlete, like if, if I was, if I was over four, like I was pretty sick that night. I didn't sleep too well, yeah. you know, um, you know, on the other hand, and I, I do recognize the fallacy in this, but it's like, if I was four for four, I was pretty happy with myself. <laughs> you know? Um, you know, we were four for four. We got the win. Great job. Like, let's go ladies. Let's do it again tomorrow. We're all feeling really good about ourselves. Yeah. Um, I think the fallacy in that is that um, at the end of the day, we are tying um, who we are to our performance and who we are uh, at the end of the day is much greater than our performance. Um, I think there's some amazing human beings that don't have the success on the field that they'd like to. And I think that there's some people that have some things to work on character wise that have great success on the field. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I think it's, it's creating the divorce between our identities and our performance. Mm. Um, when we can do that, we can have a truly, truly consistent approach to the sport. Yeah. Right. I'm not dejected at home at night because I was 0 for 4. Yeah. 
I'm asking myself the question, hey, what do I need to do differently tomorrow? Where did I fall short and what do I need to learn? And guess what? I'm not super emotional about it that I can't see what I need to do better, right? Yep. On the other hand, when I'm four for four and, and the team one by 10 runs, I'm not able to look at the game and say, what do I need to do better? Where do I need to grow? What did I do? Ryan didn't do anything wrong. We won and I went four for four. Mm. No, that's not the case. Yeah. Right. And so where we want to live is in the middle. But at the core of that is is absolutely that divorce between identity and performance. I think that's the hardest battle that any athlete will fight. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like, at, so when I asked my team, I said, I, listen, I, I, I fight my demons. I like, I, I really do. I fight my demons with this sport. And I see you, you guys don't have to raise your, your hands if you don't want to, but like, I'm curious, like, do, do you guys like, do you guys feel that? Like, does is it like eat you up inside when you don't yeah. do which, I mean, every single sh- hand shot up every single hand. And I was, I was blown away. I was like, I, first of all, like, I just appreciate your guys' willingness to be vulnerable enough to, yep. to raise your hand and say, like, I fight my demons. But it was also like really reinforcing for me and and a great reminder for me as a coach that, um, you know, everybody fights these demons. They We all go through the exact same thing. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought this up because this is exactly the demon that I was fighting, the biggest one, at least uh, my freshman year as well. And Probably the way you framed it to the divorce between the identity and the performance. Um, I think probably stayed in that marriage too long and during my college softball career, right? It's so true. And the fact that you've really like hit home that the mentality piece is the difference maker is 100% true. We say that a lot, but I feel like you've actually dug into a little bit more of why and like what that actually looks like, which I really appreciate because, you know, we can always say these like sort of platitudes however much we want, but I feel like we've gotten into the nitty gritty more, which I appreciate. Yeah. And, and we have to, um, I just don't think, I don't think very many people see it that way to Mm. be perfectly honest, because it's, it's like, well, what do you want? Like every time so-and-so gets a big hit, it's, it's posted all over social media. And I like, don't get me wrong. Like, I think it's great. Like I want, I want people to be recognized, but here's, here's what we see do great on the field and you're going to be put on a pedestal, Mm. you know, like don't do great on the field and you're going to be ignored. Um, so I, I don't know, like there's a cultural piece like that. I, I don't know, um, that we can get around at this point. I think it is what it is. So I just think we have to train, we have to train our young women to, to understand that, that we're built a little bit different. Um, you know, we are built a little bit different here. You know, if you come to Fresno, you're going to be mentally built a little bit different and you're, you're not going to, succumb to these things we we all succumb to them because we're human right but like we're not going to succumb to these things at the level that other people do and it goes both ways like I, I just can't stress that enough of like oh you think you're the coolest because you did this you're not the coolest yeah you live in the middle oh you think you suck because this happened no you don't suck you live in the middle right and to mm-hmm. have that right perception of ourselves so that we can go about our business and do a great job without just being emotionally like elated or crushed. Like we have to live in the middle. This is the exact pep talk I needed in my life right now. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> um, and I, I could keep going forever, honestly, with you, but I know that we're preparing for for some competition coming up, right? So the thing that I do every time I have a guest on the show is play a game to wrap it up called Safer Out. And uh, it's fun. It's just, I'll bring up a topic. If you like it, you agree with it, you call it safe. If you don't, you call it out. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. Let's do this. I'm excited for your takes. Okay. So the first one is the term mid-majors in reference, like compared to the power five. Safer out on the term (laughs) mid-majors. I mean, out, clearly. Do I get to expand? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, it's nonsense. You, you, you can't, because, because of the, because of the implication that comes with it, you want to call Fresno a mid-major, go for it, go for it. It's, it's not a mid-major experience though. I can tell you that. So we call it what you want, but it's nonsense. On the other hand, if, if we're choosing crappy power five experience over awesome mid-major experience. 
Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. You're not our people. Yeah. Not, not the, not the goal at the end of it either. It's yeah. a little short-sighted. Yeah. No, I, I kind of already knew your answer, obviously, but wanted to hear your thoughts behind it too. So makes sense yeah. to me. I was trying to be nice. I don't yeah. know how that came off. <laughs> no, I think it came off just fine and very straightforward, which I appreciate. So, <laughs> so the second one is the conference realignments safer out. Oh man. I mean, it's happening. Yeah. Uh, I, you fight the system. I, I'm not, I'm not here to fight the system. Uh, I'm here to do my job every single day to the best of my ability. So, I mean, safe. Yeah. Safe. Once Align you- the conferences. I'm going to grind. Yeah. Whatever happens, happens. Makes sense. I mean, to your point just now, we're talking about the power five mid-major thing. It's like, that's mattered the least it's ever mattered. Right. So if the conferences are aligned a certain way, it is what it is. Everyone's still got to compete. Yeah. I'm still going to play softball. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Good take. Okay. Last one is bat flips. Safer out. <laughs> out. 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 I had a I'm all for fun. I'm all for fun. And listen, it's like, I know I'm not everybody and not everybody has to be me. Um, I was raised in a way that like, I mean, I'm extreme. I'm totally extreme on this. Anybody that's, that's watched me coach or play knows like, I'm pretty, like, I'm pretty stoic. You're not going to get much out of me. You know, like, did you see a little flash of emotion for sure? Um, you know, like I get fired up out there, but like, I just was raised in a family where it was, and again, I, I don't think everybody needs to be wired this way. Um, but I was raised in a family where like, you don't make a show mm. like that. You don't make a show. Right. And I, it's who I am. It's who I am. And I understand other people and that's great for them. Uh, but for me, I mean, a, a bat flips a hard out, hard out. It's not yeah. for me, but it's not going to be. It's fair to say though, that that's how you feel. And you're not like, everyone has to be the same way. Like, Okay. That's exactly what my question is, right? Like, what's your take on it? How do you feel about it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm like, listen, I mean, I'm me and I'm going to be me Yeah. and I create the identity and the culture for this program. So that's not going to be the identity or culture for this program. We're not going to do that. Um, you know, but if, if other people, that's, that's fine. That's fine. But for me, that's who I'm going to be. That's who this program is going to be. And that's where we end it. Yeah. And we said it from the beginning. You said it, stay true to yourself, right? That's who we are. Yep. Well, thank you again, coach. This has been awesome. Uh, I remember watching you play back in the day too. So the fact that we fast forwarded to now doing something like this is really cool uh, on many levels. So again, appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for having me. This has been a lot of fun. I'm grateful to have Stacy on the show. I mean, I think from hearing sort of the depth of the history in the community in the Fresno State program, for example, to getting insight into her experience just in multiple parts of the game is super valuable and her toughness really stood out too. So with that, let's transition to the foul tip of the week. This week's foul tip is about taking our own advice. So recently I had a sports journalism student reach out to me. She actually called herself a softball nerd, which, which I loved, Uh, but she said she wants to go into covering it professionally in her career. And she asked for advice. And, you know, there are a couple of things that sort of came to me right away that I shared. And I said, you know, in addition to hard work, of course, consistency and visibility help. You know, you got to keep at it because you gain recognition over time. And I don't mean recognition like a nice gold star. I mean recognition as a voice in the space. And you also want to meet as many people as possible because relationships matter. And that's not just as connections that you can get things from, but as people to do this with who have the same passion as you. Then she asked me an interesting question. She said, is there anything you wish you knew about the industry when you were in college? And I reflected on this one a little bit. And eventually I did tell her, you know, it's a competitive industry. And since historically women have had less opportunities, it can feel cutthroat at times. But working together and supporting each other is not only what's right, it's best for business. I really do feel that way. And I know that I'm lucky that that's how I feel because I had women older than me with this mentality. In particular, I'm thinking about women in TV like Kate Scott, who's the voice of the 76ers, Elise Woodward, who's a play-by-play announcer, and she's up for an Emmy right now. Ashley Adamson was the heart of the Pac-12 network for the last decade. Like so many 
and they happen to be women that were really supportive. And I felt much more of a collaborative energy from them than anything else. And because of people like them answering my questions, it made me not hesitate to respond to this girl's DM, right? And it's not just women. You know, I have fantastic male colleagues who also have exhibited this and they have this mindset. And I just think, you know, that's collaboration. We keep hearing from guests how leaders before them help them get to where they are today. And we see collaboration like Jocelyn Owl being the first athlete to play with the spark in that league and Athletes Unlimited. We hear on coach calls, I hear all the time, just talking about how they'll even work together to lift up their conference as a whole, not just their individual programs, right? So this is what I mean. It's like collaborating is best for business. It's actually a smart business move. So as I'm telling this person these things, I felt like, wow, what a good reminder for me to live by these words that I'm sharing. So that's it. Take your own advice. That's the foul tip of the week. You've been listening to Believe in Softball, part of Believe Network and presented by Bet Online. The show is available anywhere you get your podcasts, wherever you listen, including Believe.com and YouTube too. Subscribe to the show, rate the show, and if you liked it, write a review for it. Follow us on Twitter slash X and Instagram at Believe in Softball. Again, that's a B-L-E-A-V. You can reach out to me personally on Twitter slash X at Jennifer zero one and Instagram at Jennifer as well. As always, thank you for tuning in and catch you soon.